today's scripture reading is Psalm 139, 13 through 18. Psalm 139, 13 through 18. If you're using the blue pew Bible in front of you, this passage can be found on page 522. Let us continue to worship and delight in our God and feel his delight in us through the reading of his holy and inerrant word. Please stand. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let me pray for us once more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have this morning to be gathered together as a church. We ask that as we hear your word preached, that your spirit would not only make known to us, what your word says, but also to teach us how we might be able to apply these truths in our lives. We recognize that when your word goes out, it does not return void, but it accomplishes that which you purpose. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My house school U.S. government teacher was the first person to introduce me to the Supreme Court case Roe v. Wade. She simply taught us that the decision of Roe versus Wade legalized abortion across the United States. And she taught us that abortion referred to the elective termination of unborn life within a mother's womb. Now, the Supreme Court decided Roe versus Wade on June 22, 1973. Now, I doubt that my U.S. government teacher, when she taught me back in high school, that this decision would actually be overturned by another decision called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. We oftentimes refer to this case as the Dobbs decision. And the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government did not have the ability to determine if abortion is legal. And therefore, each state now must determine the legal status of abortion. Now, some might think that because of the Dobbs decision, abortion would have either stopped or slowed down. But it did not. Abortions continue. They continue to occur. Why? Now, there are a few reasons why I think that abortions continue, and these are just a few. I think the first thing is that you cannot legislate morality. Laws do not make one moral. In fact, one might even say that the law awakens our flesh to actually break the law. Because if you see a sign, do not walk on the lawn, you have a desire to walk on that lawn. That nice, green, manicured grass. A sign warns, do not press this button. And you think, what would it be like to touch that button? And for those of you who are parents, you understand this. You tell your child, don't throw this. They look at you, they look at the object, they smile, and they throw it. You tell them, don't touch this. They look at that hot pot, they look at you, and they start moving towards it. Right? That the law incites you to break it because it shows there is something broken within us, an inclination towards disobedience. Now, there's a second reason, is that 
The reason why abortions continue is because many states have legalized abortions. This means that if someone has the means and the ability, they can travel to a state that has legalized abortion to attain one. The Dobbs decision didn't ban abortion. It merely said, states, you decide. And some states have decided that abortion should remain legal. Now, there's also a third reason. And this is a little bit more internal. I think the third reason why abortions continue is because our vision of the good life, a term that I take from an author named Smith, James K.A. Smith, he says that maybe we have a vision of life, the good life, and that's what directs what we do. And I think that maybe our vision of the good life has changed. Because maybe once, the vision of the good life was having a home, children, maybe a dog. And then to make it in life was to settle down, start a family. But now, the vision of the good life has changed. It's about pursuing a good career, traveling, becoming an Instagram, TikTok sensation, and then maybe you start a family. And that children, instead of being a source of blessing, they prevent us from pursuing our desires. They drain our money. Instead of seeing a child, you see diapers, doctor's appointments, milk formula, food that needs to be fed that they do not eat, burden. They rob time from our interests. Instead of being able to pursue my fishing on Saturday morning, I wake up at 6 o'clock to the sounds of my child. They burden our lives. And maybe that's the reason why abortions continue. Now, this Sunday's theme is Sanctity of Life. And this is not just this Sunday, but every year we set aside a Sunday to think together about what does the Bible say about unborn life? What does the Bible have to tell us about unborn life within a mother's womb? How does God view that child that is growing and developing within a mother? What should we think about that unborn life? Now, to answer this question, we're going to go to a time way before Supreme Courts, a time before ultrasounds, blood tests, x-rays, a time before Excel sheets, chat GBT, Instagram, TikTok. We're going to reflect on the meditations of a man who lived over 3,000 years ago. A king, a king of Israel, and his future son would be the wisest man on earth, a man after God's own heart, a shepherd, and his name is David. Now, David grounded his thinking about unborn life, not on the law, not on medicine or statistics. His thinking began with theology. He began his thinking with God. And thoughts about who God is led him to conclusions about unborn life. And we see his reflections in Psalm 139. So if you haven't turned there already, that's where we're going to be spending all our time this morning. Psalm 139. So please turn there in your Bibles. Now, we just had verses 13 through 18 read for us, but this morning we'll walk through the entirety of the psalm, but most of our attention will be on those verses that Dina just read, verse 13 through 18. Now, before we get into the text, let me give you a roadmap of where we're going to go this morning, a little preview trailer of things to come. First, we'll look at two premises, two assumptions, and then we're going to look at David's argument, his idea. What is he trying to get across? And then we'll be looking at an application, an action step, an implication. So again, there'll be four moves in this morning's sermon, four major sections, two premises, an argument, and an implication. So let's talk about David's first premise, his first assumption. His first assumption is this, that no one escapes God's examination because God is omniscient. 
He knows your thoughts, your feelings, your motives. He knows everything that goes on in your inner being. Nothing escapes God's notice, his attention, his examination, because he is omniscient. No one escapes God's examination because God is omniscient. And David realizes this. David realizes that God knows his thoughts. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 139. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. And that word search is used to describe a miner searching for precious ore under the earth. And like a miner, God searches and finds David's thoughts, his affections, his feelings. And God knows our thoughts, our affections, our feelings. And God's ability to know David's thoughts amazes him. Look at verse 6. It says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain this. God's ability to know David's thoughts is supernatural. No human can do this. It is unattainable. Only God knows what you could possibly say before you said it. And he also knows not only what you said, but also why you said it. Now, David isn't the only one to recognize God's omniscience. I mean, we see other people in the Bible who also recognize God's omniscience. A prophet in the Old Testament once told the king Asa that nothing escapes his notice because God knew that Asa had formed an alliance with foreign countries rather than depend on God. And Jesus teaches a crowd of the Sermon on the Mount that even before you ask God for something, he knows what you need. So David isn't alone in acknowledging God's omniscience. So that's the first premise. God is omniscient, and nothing escapes God's examination. He knows what you think. He knows what you feel. He knows what you desire. So second premise, second assumption. No one can escape God's presence because God is omnipresent. There is no place you can run, no place you can hide from God. No bunker, no cave, no door can bar him entrance. God is present everywhere that you can possibly go. He is omnipresent. Even in death, you cannot escape God. No one can escape God's presence because he is omnipresent. And David recognizes this. He recognizes that he cannot escape God's presence even if he goes to the highest peak or to the depths of the earth. Look at verse 8. It says, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So if David climbed the highest mountain on the earth to reach the heavens, God would be there. And David uses a Hebrew term, Sheol, to designate the lowest part of the earth where the dead dwell. If David somehow was able to make it to the depths of the earth where the dead reside, God would be there too. So if David went to the highest place on the earth or the lowest place on the earth, God would be present. And David can't escape God's presence by hiding in the darkness either. Look at verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. The best time for stealth is at night. And so it reminds me of some books that I've been reading uh, from a series called The Terminal List. Okay? And it follows the adventures of a former Navy SEAL, James Reese. All his missions occur at night because darkness conceals his presence from his enemies. Darkness can conceal you from others. But darkness cannot conceal your presence from God. Wherever you are in the darkness, God is there. Now, David isn't the only one to recognize that God is omnipresent. There are also other biblical authors who recognize that no one can escape from God's presence. I mean, King Solomon's prayer to God as he dedicates the temple explains that God cannot be contained in this temple and in the heavens of the earth, because God is too big. His presence is too vast because he is everywhere. 
The prophet Jeremiah warns the people of Israel that no one can hide from God because whenever an Israelite sins, God is present. And the Bible affirms that God is omnipresent. So David gives these two premises, two assumptions, two data points. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God knows all things. God is present everywhere. So if God is omniscient and omnipresent, then what is David's argument? What's his proposition? What is his thesis? Unborn life is God's work. That unborn life is God's work because he is omniscient and omnipresent. Because God knows all things and is present in all places, God creates unborn life. He creates the life within a mother's womb. It is not just the work of a man and a woman. It is God's work. Unborn life is God's work because he is omniscient and he is omnipresent. And we see this in David's psalm. Now, each major section within Psalm 139 is separated into three parts. First part, David states an idea. Second, David develops this idea, and then lastly, he makes a conclusion. So verse 13 to 18 mark one of the major sections within Psalm 139, and that section can be broken into three parts. You have verse 13, which is the idea, verse 14 through 16, which is the development, and verse 17 to 18 is the conclusion. So in that first section, David states an idea, that David acknowledges that God created his unborn life. Why? Because God is omniscient and omnipresent. Look at verse 13. It says, For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Note in verse 13, the conjunction that begins the verse is the word for. This conjunction connects the idea of verse 13 to verse 1 through 11. That since God is omniscient and omnipresent, God created unborn David in his mother's womb. Now, look at how David describes who is responsible for his creation. It's God. Look at verse 13 again. For you, referring to God, form my inward parts. You, referring to God, knitting me together in my mother's womb. And that the creation within the womb is God's doing. And while a father and mother, again, contribute to the conception of a child, David attributes the work of conception, ultimately, to God. Now, David also uses artistic language to describe unborn life. If you look at verse 13 again, he uses the word knitted. Now, people in the ancient Near East would use this Hebrew word for knitted in the context of creating a tapestry. Now, a tapestry is separate than a carpet or rug. A tapestry is a form of textile art, and tapestries oftentimes depict a scene or an image. And I think that word knitted is fitting in this context because who do human beings represent? Who do they image? They image God. That when God weaves together a person in a mother's womb, he creates a representation of himself. And David's use of this artistic language reveals the beauty of that unborn life. So that's the idea. And the second section, and the second part in this section, is he develops this idea. Now, David develops this idea of God creating unborn life through meditation. As David meditates, reflects on God creating his life, it leads him to praise. Let's look at David's meditation. Because he realizes that he is made in such a way that it produces all. Look at verse 14. It says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now when we hear the word fear in verse 14, we oftentimes think of the word or the idea of being afraid. But the word fear in Hebrew can also have the nuance of reverence the nuance of awe. As David thinks about how God made him, it causes him to feel wonder. Why? It's because all of God's works 
are wonderful. That's what he says in the second half of this verse, verse 14. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And many of us can acknowledge that God's works are wonderful. I mean, we marvel at the beautiful vista of the Rocky Mountains. The depth and breadth of the Grand Canyon fills us with awe. We might even feel our hair stand up as we see a chunk of glacier plunge into the sea. That God's works are good. Now think of this logic. God's works are good. I am God's work. Therefore, I must be good, right? So some of us think that we were good maybe at a certain life stage. I mean, I was cute, chubby, cuddly, age zero to three. But then afterwards, I don't quite see myself as good, wonderful, or amazing. I mean, don't you remember teenage years? Braces, acne, voice change. I mean, but then the Bible says that you are God's good work no matter the life stage. From the moment of conception to present, no matter the stage of life. From unborn, newborn, infant, toddler, child, teen, young adult. Not really sure what the transition is to adult. But then young adult to adult, and then adult to senior, right? And David recognizes that all these stages of life begin in his unborn self. Look at verse 15. It says, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Now note that phrase in verse 15, depths of the earth. It is a way of describing a mother's womb. David is saying that all of adult me was made in my mother's womb when I was unborn. That means that unborn life and adult life have equal value, equally good, equally wonderful, equally amazing. And why does David believe this? Look at the words and phrases in this verse again. It says, hidden, secret, depths of the earth. These are places that human beings cannot go. I mean, I cannot go into a mother's womb. Physically, I would not fit. But who is present everywhere? God. And no one can escape God's presence, not even the unborn, because David believes that God is present when that unborn life is conceived and is wonderful. And David understands that if God created unborn life, then God also knows all that David will do for the days of his life. Look at verse 16. It says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. David uses an image, a book, and he uses that book to describe God's omniscience. God can record everything that we will do because he knows our thoughts and actions even before we do them. So we covered two parts of the psalm, the idea, the development. So let's look at the last part, the conclusion. After his reflection, meditation on his unborn life, David feels valued, cherished, treasured. And David feels valued, cherished, treasured, because God created him with purpose. Look at verse 17. It says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. The word thoughts in verse 17 could also be rendered the word intent. And if you replace thoughts with intent then verse 17 would say, How precious to me are your intent, your purposes for me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. That God has a purpose for David's life, a plan, a blueprint, and this causes him to be valued because he has significance. And he describes those intents, those purposes, as precious. Now, David wakes up from this meditation, and oftentimes when we wake up, we forget what we dreamed about, what we thought about, pretty quickly. But in verse 18, he says again, he says, I awake, and I'm still with you. That these thoughts of God creating David's unborn life do not fade, 
do not end, do not conclude, but they remain with him, that he continues to think about them, ruminate about them, that unborn life is God's work. Now, David isn't alone in this thinking. I mean, there are other parts in the Bible that also affirm this idea. Let me give you some examples. So the book of Genesis affirms that God opens and closes the womb. I remember the story of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Her womb was closed for many years, but then at the age of 90, God opens the womb and she conceives a son. Remember Rebecca, Isaac's wife? She experienced infertility. And then Isaac prays to God to open her womb, and God answers, and she conceives of twins. Remember Rachel, Jacob's wife? She complains about her inability to conceive a child. And then Jacob snaps back, who am I? Am I God to open up your womb? It again affirms that God creates unborn life. And the book of Genesis affirms that. Now, it's not just limited to Genesis, because Job, when he suffers, also acknowledges that God created his unborn life. When God calls Jeremiah to serve as a prophet, he says, even before you were born, I created you for this purpose. So there are other parts in the Bible that also affirm that unborn life is God's work. So if unborn life is God's work, then it is a work that we should value. That we should value unborn life because it is God's work. Now think about this. To oppose the work of God ultimately is to oppose God himself. I mean, isn't that the original sin? That God tells humanity to obey him by exercising dominion over the earth, be fruitful and multiply, and to extend his image on the earth. And Adam and Eve tell him, no. By eating from the tree they commanded them not to eat from. And this results in a curse upon all of humanity. To not acknowledge God's work, his commands, is to say in essence, God, please sit down. I, a human being, will determine what is your work and what is not. And that we elevate ourselves above God, but then who are we as human beings, created individuals, to tell our creator, I think you made a mistake when you labeled that unborn life as a human being, as someone with value, dignity, and needing protection. We need to affirm and value God's work. Now, this leads us to the final point in the message, the implication, the application. And the application is this, that we need to think God's thoughts about unborn life while avoiding ungodly thoughts. That we need to align our thinking to God's thinking. We need to sync up our values to God's values. And at the same time, we need to stay away from thoughts that oppose God, to distance ourselves from philosophies that do not align with what God says in his word. That we are to think God's thoughts about unborn life while avoiding ungodly thoughts. And ungodly thoughts come from ungodly people. This is why David wishes to distance himself from ungodly people. Look at verse 19. It says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. Get away from me. Move away. And moving away from those thoughts, he wants to align his thoughts to God's thoughts. He wants to sync up his convictions with God's convictions. And this causes David to ask God, examine me. Look at my thoughts. Search my heart. Look at verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Look at all the imperatives in verse 23 to 24. You have search, know, try, know again, see. And these, this idea of searching, examination, is used in the context where a blacksmith would put a precious metal in a crucible, heat it up in a fire so that he can find all the little impurities and remove them. And the same idea is here that David wants God to analyze all his thoughts and remove any type of ungodly thinking. And he concludes with this request, lead me in the way everlasting, found in verse 24. The phrase way everlasting refers to a manner of life that will last. And the only life that will last 
is one that lives in accordance to God's will. To align my life to be a godly person is to align myself with God's values, to sync up my thoughts with his thoughts. Now, since God has thoughts about unborn life, then we need to align our thinking to his, that we need to think God's thoughts about unborn life. So what do we need to believe and think about unborn life? Every unborn life is made ultimately in the image of God, a tapestry. To be made in the image of God means that every single person, regardless of size, age, gender, and cognitive ability, has significance and value. They are significant because this person represents him. And we have a responsibility to love our neighbor by protecting and preserving that life. But every unborn life is also born into sin. David describes in another psalm his sinful state even when he was in his mother's womb. This means that no person inside the womb or outside of the womb is not affected by sin. That sin means that we are born in a state of rebellion against God. Instead of confessing our sins, instead of repenting, we find ourselves trying to cover ourselves up by good works. Or we might just say, why even live a good life? I'll just live according to my impulses. And we are people who need help. And God knows that we need help, and he sends it. And he sends it not in the form of a spirit, in the form of a fire, in the form of a cloud. He sends it in the form of unborn life life. That Jesus begins his incarnation as unborn life to save us from sin. That Jesus in every sense was like us. If God wove together Jesus in his mother's womb with the intent to save us from our sins, then God does so to create value in a lesser extent with every single conception. And Jesus would eventually be born, would eventually grow up, He would eventually give his life on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and he would rise again from the dead. And this gives every person born of a woman to believe and have a relationship with God. It also means that all of our sins have been forgiven in Christ. Now, for some of you, this morning's message is uncomfortable because maybe you've had an abortion. You might feel the shame, the guilt, the sadness. You look at that dining table, and you think about that missing daughter. Would she be 12 years old this year? You wonder, what kind of sports would she be playing? Would she prefer to play piano, violin? Would she have my eyes? What kind of food would she enjoy? And I just want to say to you, that God forgives you. He knows your pain. He knows your grief. He loves you, and his grace is sufficient for you. And I confess, as a minister of the gospel, that the church has not always done a good job caring for those who have had an abortion. And for that, I apologize. And may the Lord help us as a church to be a safe place for those who are struggling with a crisis pregnancy, an unwanted pregnancy, might feel safe to share. That we might come alongside them to work through that decision, to listen to their story, to be a brother, a sister, to walk with them through this difficult time. Now, to think God's thoughts about unborn life is not enough. That thinking God's thoughts about unborn life means advocating for unborn life as well. So how do we do that? Let me give you four ways. First, we can pray that all people would see the preciousness of unborn life. Yeah, we can use reasoning, arguments to make a case for unborn life, but ultimately only God could change the hearts and minds of people. And may the Lord enable us to pray that more people will see that unborn child as God's work, that she be protected, cherished, valued. Now, the second thing would be to care for the children within our church. Now, you may be thinking, hang on a second, I thought we were talking about unborn life, sanctity of life. 
It's easy for us sometimes to advocate for the life within the womb. It's the life that we do not see. But once the life exits the mother's womb, our care and concern oftentimes tapers. Now, if we believe that the unborn life is a human being, then we should also see the infant, the child, the toddler, even teenager and adolescent as made in the image of God requiring value to be cherished. Or do we see that child that's running around at church screaming, drooling, throwing food everywhere as a nuisance, as an annoyance? Or do we see them as a person made in the image of God? Do we consider volunteering for nursery duty? Do we consider signing up to help in children's ministry where they scream, yell, draw on the walls, and tear out pages of the Bible? Do we serve with our youth who are trying to figure out what does it look like to be in Christ in this world because we believe that every single person from unborn life to senior is cherished and valued? Let me give you a third example. A third way to apply this truth is that we are to care for the mothers of unwanted pregnancies and single moms. And one of the ways is, as Jason prayed earlier this morning, to volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center. But if we believe that the unborn life is God's work that should be preserved and protected, then we also need to care for the mother who carries that child to term. Now, many of you know who are parents that it's difficult to raise children with two parents. So imagine being a single parent. You never get a break. You're always on alert. Your head is on a swivel, scanning, scanning, scanning. Do I have all my kids? You try to account for all of them. You never have an opportunity to eat because you're making sure that your children are eating. You want to sleep, but you can't because there's another load of clothing to wash, toys to be picked up, food to be prepped because you need to pack their lunch. There is no spouse to help you when you say, she had a blowout. No one to get that extra diaper. I need help carrying her so I could use the restroom. No one to carry that child. And you have to figure out how you manage this child as you try to do your business. And how can you help? How can you help a single mom even within our congregation? Again, serve in children's ministry. Mr. Frank did not pay me to say that. Because as you teach in Sunday school, maybe you'll find out that one of your students doesn't have a dad. He doesn't have someone to throw a baseball with, shoot a basketball with. And you decide, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take him to the park and throw a baseball with him. I'm going to take him to the basketball court and shoot a basketball with him. He doesn't have a father who will drop off a birthday gift to celebrate his birthday. But maybe you are the one who shows up with that gift. Maybe you see and recognize that there's a child within your class that doesn't have a mom. Maybe you invite that child out when you take your kids to the park. Maybe you show up to her piano recital. Maybe you show up to her performance because mom is not going to be there. And there are children who are growing up without a mom and dad within our congregation. Will we be willing to step into that gap to be that mom, to be that dad? Because there's no one there. So that when they grow up, they might be able to say, yes, I grew up without a mom. Yes, I grew up with a dad. But you know what? I went to a church where I had more uncles and aunties who cared for me than any person could ever have. And I was valued, and I was cherished, and my single dad and mom was cared for. Are we willing to step into that gap? And lastly, we can also take effort to learn more about God's view of unborn life. DesiringGod.com has plenty of articles on the topic. 
You can also review previous sermons that our church has preached. You might even consider picking up a book at the bookstall titled Case for Life by Scott Klusendorf, who serves as a president of a ministry called Life Training Institute. There will be books in the bookstall later. So let's return to that original question I posed at the beginning of this message. What does God think about unborn life? He views that unborn life as his work. And we should think the same. If unborn life is God's work, then we should protect it, preserve it, advocate for it. Now, Dr. Seuss wrote a book called Horton Hears a Who. And it follows the adventure of an elephant named Horton who works hard to protect a people called the Who's that live on this little itty-bitty speck of dust. And these Who's live in a city called Whoville. And since they are so small, the other animals in the jungle can't see them or hear them and tries to get rid of them. But Horton, the elephant, tries to defend all these small people from kangaroos, monkeys, and eagle. And why? Because he says, because after all, a person's a person, no matter how small. May the Lord help us to be able to think the same. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that the topic of unborn life is one that brings discomfort. It brings perhaps unwanted thoughts. And I pray for those who have had an abortion that your spirit would comfort them this morning, that they would know that they are forgiven in Christ, and that we as a church might be able to come alongside them. Help us, Lord, to think your thoughts about unborn life. Help us to see how you see it as valued, cherished, and loved. And might we do the same by the power of your spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.